So welcome again. <laughs> and as I was just saying, uh, I had 10 days in America three years ago. The reason I went was that my sabbatical project in 2019, and I've shared this with folks before, the project was to explore and walk as many different labyrinths as I could. Most of them were in this country and there are ancient ones, medieval ones, there are modern ones, there are ones in hospices and hospitals and parks and country mansions. So I had a lot to go and visit in this country. But when I was uh, thinking about the use of labyrinths as a spiritual and meditative exercise, one of the first books I read was a book by somebody called Lauren Artris. And I'm just going to screen share with you the first slide. Now this is, uh, this is a book by Lauren Artris called Walking a Sacred Path. And, oh, Rosemary Wakelin's just joining us, so I'll let her in. And I learned something about Lauren Artris and I discovered that she was an Episcopal priest in uh, San Francisco in California and that she was based at somewhere called Grace Cathedral. And in the 1990s, she walked to the famous labyrinth at Chartres in France and wanted to bring a labyrinth back to Grace Cathedral as something spiritual that people could do uh, when they came to visit the cathedral. So the first thing she did was she had a, oh, I think she organized it herself. They made a woven one, um, a woven labyrinth, which they had out in the floor of this cathedral. And dozens and dozens and dozens of people came to walk it and to do it as a spiritual thing and to pray as they did it. And it was used so much that it got worn out. And eventually um, a labyrinth was installed in the floor of the cathedral. And eventually again, another labyrinth was built outside the cathedral. So I knew that there were these two labyrinths based at Grace Cathedral in San Francisco. And I, I knew that Lauren Artress was retired now um, but I thought maybe if I went there, <laughs> I'd sort of catch a glimpse of her or something. I don't know. It just seemed a good place to go, especially as I, in recent years, had got to know an American couple called Matt and Barbara. And Matt and Barbara live in Kansas. And they have, um, they have a home in Wyndham that they come to every summer. And they're Methodists, so when they live in Wyndham, they go to the Methodist church. So over a period of several years, I had got to know Matt and Barbara. So it seemed to me that um, a good thing to do on my sabbatical, just to um, give an excitement in, to the whole thing, would be to go to San Francisco and then to go to Kansas. I mean, when I thought of doing this, I'm not sure I realized exactly all that was involved in the traveling and everything, um, but I managed to do it. I did it on my own. It was quite scary uh, in some places. And as I show you some pictures from both San Francisco and from Kansas, I'll tell you some stories as I go along. Uh, the one or two scary stories, and one or two exciting ones, and one or two ones where God was so obviously at work, it just um, it just took me by surprise. 
But I'm just going to go to my next slide. Uh, still on Lauren Artress, um, she founded a website called uh, Veritidas. That comes into my story later on. So that's the homepage at the moment of the Veritidas website. Well, here's um, a map of the world from Google Maps today. And if you look at the United Kingdom, you can see a little blue circle. That's me on my phone today, the GPS showing my phone and where I was in the United Kingdom. I think it's amazing what GPS does and how we can see things in real time um, today, as it were. So this is just to put it in context. We, we all know where the United States is, so I didn't really need to show you a map. Um, but uh, it's helpful to me <laughs> to see the distance I travelled. Oh, I've got an arrow pointing to me there. And here's one pointing to California. Uh, San Francisco is somewhere on the coast near where that arrow is. I'm not sure exactly where it is on this uh, scale of map. And that's the state of Kansas. And Matt and Barbara live right on the right hand side uh, along the border with Missouri, although they call it Missouri. And one thing I had to learn when I went was obviously that they do actually speak a different language. Um, Jen, are you coming? Yeah. Well, I'm going to start with San Francisco. That's where I went first. And the first scary thing was uh, the aeroplane flight because I'm not that keen on flying as many people are not. I knew it would be 12 hours. But the scariest thing was what I was going to do the other end when I got there. But I consoled myself with at least the thought that at least everybody would speak a sort of English. But uh, I was still a bit concerned about landing in the airport and then getting myself to the hotel in the middle of San Francisco. But the first amazing thing that happened was I was sitting next to a lady on her own on the plane a middle-aged lady and uh, we got talking and she was going out to meet her husband who was working out in San Francisco and she was a bit nervous as well and so she was going to a hotel in the middle of San Francisco and uh, she also wasn't sure what to do at the airport so we decided to join forces and it seemed like a bit of a <laughs> a gift that I'd been given someone to, um, to share a taxi with. Our doorbell has just gone, but I think Jen will go. Jen, that was our doorbell. Perhaps it's Mr. Amazon. <laughs> Sometimes is at this time. Okay. Here's another map. San Fran, uh, California, Part of California is that shape like a thumb in the bottom left hand corner there and most of that is San Francisco and the red marker there is the hotel I was staying in the Chancellor Hotel on Union Square well my lady friend who I'd met and I we we managed to to get a taxi and uh, we gave the names of both the hotels and the taxi driver said they were near each other. So he said he would take us to the ladies hotel and off we went. Oh, I forgot I've got those slides. Here was the hotel I was going to, the Chancellor Hotel. And here is a photograph I took out of the taxi window on the way there. Of course, when you when you get into a place and you're actually staying there, it becomes much more manageable <laughs> and you you learn where you are and how to get around. But on this first view, it was just all a bit overwhelming and uh, I haven't got a photo of it, but 
as we'd come in on the aeroplane, I'd seen San Francisco Bay opening out before us and the blue expanse of the sea, and it all just seemed absolutely amazing. I'm just going to go back to those two other slides I had. Um, the arrow pointing there is for the Golden Gate Bridge, which I'll show you a photo of shortly. Jen's just joining me here. And I thought you'd like to see the, the grid system of central San Francisco. The Chancellor Hotel is actually in the middle there with a red marker that's a bit bigger and redder than all the others, but it doesn't matter if you can't see it. I just find it fascinating the way uh, American cities were created in blocks like this. I don't know whether it makes it easier to find your way around or not really. So we drove to the ladies hotel. It turns out to be exactly opposite the Chancellor Hotel where I was staying. I mean, what are the chances of that? But there we are. So that scary bit was over and done with. And I was ensconced on one of those floors in the hotel. I can't remember which one now. I had most of my evening meals in Laurie's Diner. That's not really Elvis on the right there. It was um, a lookalike stunt double. It, actually, it's a model. <laughs> uh, so Laurie's Diner did a good chicken and chips. And at lunch times, so I just bought a roll and some cheese. I had five days there, and of course, I'd gone to see Grace Cathedral and those labyrinths that I told you about. But I also had a couple of days sightseeing. And I'll just show you some of the sites very quickly. Union Square turned out to be not terribly exciting. And uh, that's one view of it. That's another view of it. That's the Golden Gate Bridge in the middle there. The department store Macy's was nearby and that was just amazing. You can see on the left there, some of the glass structures that they had in place. I'm just gonna let in Heather and Doreen. So uh, I bought some things for my grandchildren from Macy's. They're probably not much different to what I'd have bought at home, but it just seems special that they came from this big supermarket in San Francisco. There's a cable car system and uh, the, the heritage tram cars running, but it does also serve the function of getting you from one point to another. Um, I, I traveled on one of these and I wanted to hang on to the outside like those people are doing. But um, the one I got was more or less empty. So it seemed a bit funny hanging on to the outside when you could sit inside. So um, I ended up sitting inside. And on one day I took an open top bus trip. Now I had to choose which bus company um, to use, there was the most popular and the most frequent bus company, uh, but it did not go across the Golden Gate Bridge. It only went up to the end of it. And there was a smaller, more independent um, bus company that didn't run so frequently, that did go across the Golden Gate Bridge. So I chose the latter, more of the bus company in a minute. Back to my map of um, San Francisco, and this is zooming in a bit now. This is the top of that thumb bit, and the arrow is showing the Chancellor Hotel where I was staying, well, that red marker is. I'm just going to show you um, where the bus went a little bit. It went to Fisherman's Wharf where there, I didn't really understand it. There's piers numbered one to something. Most famous one, I think is Pier 39. I didn't get off at these piers, so I'm not sure exactly what they were. The bus also went so you could have a good view of Alcatraz Island, that's being pointed to there. Uh, then there's the Golden Gate Bridge, which I've already mentioned. 
Then the arrow that's appeared down the left hand side now is the Golden Gate Park, which the bus went by there. And the last arrow that's appeared is pointing to a famous road of houses, which uh, is called the Painted Ladies. I'll show you a photo of all these things in a minute. So I had a good time traveling around on the open top bus. In fact, I went round twice. Here's Pier 39. I've taken this from the bus, so I didn't get out. Um, that's, that's another view. Here's uh, the Island of Alcatraz on the left of that photo. And here's another view of it. You could, I could have spent a whole day having a trip over there, but it, it, I didn't really fancy it. So just looking at it from the top of an open top bus was fine. Here's the Golden Gate Bridge. And I've taken this from the, um, actually, I don't know where. I, yes, I think I've taken it from the top of the bus, that view. And uh, here's another view on the left and on the right is when we crossed over the other side and I took a view looking back. It was quite an experience traveling over the bridge. Um, it was suggested that uh, that we should come under cover as we went through. I didn't, but those people are under the cover, that we should hold on to our hats and our glasses and that it would be very windy. And indeed it was, but I managed not to lose anything. Now I'll just show you some of the other things we saw on the bus. That's the painted ladies, uh, so-called because of um, ladies of, well, never mind, just ladies who might be painted. Anyway, um, these are Victorian houses that I think they must have been more colorful in their time because they didn't look terribly colorful to me. The bus went past some very posh houses indeed and we were told that that was uh, real estate. We went past the oldest house in San Francisco which has a garden in front. Most of the houses, I don't know if this is true throughout the States, um, but they have their yard at the back not so much a garden at the front but this house which was one of the first ones to be built when uh, the state was uh, colonized this one has a garden at the front this is a church called st paul's which is where the film sister act was filmed this is the entrance to chinatown all these i've taken from the bus um, there was a large mural to Jimi Hendrix. That's the lady's legs coming out of a window. That seemed to be um, a main tourist attraction. Thought you'd like to see it. <laughs> and more, uh, more soberly, this is a church called St. Francis of Assisi. And of course it's because of St. Francis of Assisi that San Francisco is called San Francisco because um, the first settlers in the 18th century uh, were from Spain, they were Catholics. They named the place they settled in after St. Francis. Well, the Golden Gate Park, when I went round the on the bus the second time, I thought I would get off in one particular place. And I decided to get off at the Golden Cape Park. Now I hadn't realized how, um, how large it was, <laughs> but I got off and I had a bit of a wander, took this nice photograph and this one, but I wasn't really there. Um, enough time to properly explore. And I was conscious of the time because the afternoon was getting on a bit now. I'm just coming up to my second scary thing. Whoops, sorry. Um, the afternoon was getting on and I thought I must go back to the bus stop. 
so that I catch the next bus as it comes round. So I did go back to the uh, I did go back to the bus stop, and that arrow on the left hand side is pointing to the Golden Gate Park. And I waited and I waited and I waited. The more frequent bus companies buses came along, but because I had got the one as I told you that uh, had less buses. They were more conspicuous by their absence. There were some other people also waiting there, and they told me that we could go on the different bus company if we got the exact money. But this was a problem because A, I didn't know how much the exact money was, and B, I wasn't sure I would have it. So it's getting darker, and so I was stuck where that red arrow is, and the hotel is where that marker still is on the right hand side rather a lot of blocks away. I think that's probably three miles. I'm not sure now, three miles rings a bell. And I was facing the prospect of having to walk all the way across uh, and, and dusk was coming on when suddenly <laughs> across the horizon came a bus with the white markings on it. I was so relieved. And uh, I don't know if that was their last bus of the day but I was able to get on it. And there was a very chatty and cheery chap who was being the, um, can't think what, the commentator. And he kept singing songs, but I didn't mind. It meant I got a lift all the way back to the hotel. Now, I need to tell you about um, Grace Cathedral. Uh, I've just shared with you the more sightseeing parts of my visit to San Francisco. But this is why I had gone. This big um, cathedral now looks old, it looks Gothic, but of course it isn't being in America. And in fact, it was built um, in the last century. Uh, in other words, not that too many decades ago. It's a fairly recent building, but built in a Gothic style. And from where the hotel was, I had to walk up a very, um, a very steep hill and then another steep hill. And then I got to Grace Cathedral. So I had two or three days in which I was able to go to different events and do different things. Now, I didn't expect to like this cathedral because of its uh, modernness. <laughs> and because it was in San Francisco, I don't know why that would make a difference. But when you're used to the medieval cathedrals of this country, I really didn't expect to like Grace Cathedral. But actually, I absolutely loved it. As soon as I walked in, it felt a prayerful and very, very lovely place. And here is one view of the inside. That's the font in the foreground. And you can see the inside labyrinth just beyond the font. And there's somebody walking it. And whenever I went into this building, there was usually somebody walking either the outside or the inside labyrinth. Here's a closer up view of the labyrinth. It's based because of Lauren Artress, who I told you about, she went to Chartres Cathedral. She wanted to replicate the Chartres Cathedral labyrinth uh, in Grace Cathedral. And so that is what that is. That is a replica of the labyrinth at Chartres. And here's another view of the labyrinth and here are people walking it. There's one lady in the middle. And here's the outside labyrinth. Um, the, the days I explored the cathedral were not particularly sunny and I think it was probably raining. Yes, that person over there's got an umbrella. Um, but it didn't matter. It was still absolutely lovely to walk it. And there's me. I asked somebody, a stranger, I asked them to take my photograph for me. I did a tour of the cathedral. That's Todd in the middle there. He was the guide. On the Sunday, I went to an evening communion service, which was held on the labyrinth. Well, it sort of was. You see a chair in the bottom left-hand corner there, 
Well, that's over there is where all the chairs were. So most of the service was not on the labyrinth. But then when it came to taking communion, everybody went and stood round the labyrinth and we received communion from the table in the middle there. Of course, I didn't take a photo in the actual service, but here's a photo just beforehand. And then something else I did, which I thought was quite brave, was I went to an event in the cathedral called a sound bath. Now I'd heard of sound baths in this country without really knowing what it is. And I'd seen beforehand that there would be a sound bath at Grace Cathedral. And I'd booked a ticket before I'd left this country. I'd read the instructions and it said that you should bring with you uh, a yoga type mat, a blanket and a pillow. Well, I thought, well, I was still on terra firma here. How am I gonna take a mat, a blanket and a pillow? Um, but I, I did buy a yoga mat and I took it separately from my other luggage. Um, I bought an inflatable cushion and I took a sort of, uh, I took a blanket um, and I decided that I would take them to this sound bath. And then when I was leaving San Francisco, I, I would get rid of them somehow. <laughs> so I hadn't got so much luggage to go to Kansas. Anyway, the sound bath was quite an experience. It wasn't actually anything to do with the cathedral staff. It was an outside uh, group that had hired the cathedral, which I didn't realize. And so there was a man who you might be able to see in the middle there holding a microphone. And he, in fact, he played piano music for about three quarters of an hour. And everybody lay down on their mat and uh, absorbed the atmosphere of Grace Cathedral and let themselves have a spiritual experience immersed in the sound. So that's one of the um, stranger things I've done in my life. <laughs> and everyone else or most other people were much younger than I was. Um, but I'm really glad I did it. It was quite an experience. Another thing that happened in the daytime was there was a choir on the labyrinth. It, I think lots of things happen on the labyrinth in Grace Cathedral. Now, before I move on to the next slide, I need to take you back to what I was talking about at the beginning and how I went to San Francisco because of having read Lauren Artress's book. And she, she is known as the founder of the modern Christian labyrinth movement. So she's she was really like a guru. And as I said, I thought maybe I would be able to encounter in some way if I went to Grace Cathedral. But it was better than that. Again, before I actually left the country, I'd gone on to that website I showed you earlier, the Veritas website, and they were having an auction of promises. They were auctioning off finger labyrinths and various um, spiritual things and artifacts and, and they were raising money for their organization. <clears throat> and the top thing they were auctioning off was lunch with Lauren Artress. Well, I saw this and I thought, I wonder how many people bid for that and how much it, goes for and I also thought if I tried bidding for it um would she be able to do lunch on the five days that I'm in San Francisco well I uh so I emailed the website and I said I'd like to bid for this I'm coming to San Francisco for five days at this time would Lauren be able to to offer me lunch in that time and she herself emailed me back and said, yes, she could certainly give me lunch in that time period. <laughs> so it gave me the incentive to bid um, for this sort of auction lot. And somebody bid against me. Now it did go, it did go up quite a bit, but I had got a budget for my sabbatical. And 
I just thought it would be a light once in a lifetime experience. Going to America was anyway once in a lifetime experience. But I thought if I could have lunch with Lauren Artress, who was this labyrinth guru, that would sort of make my sabbatical. So I kept bidding. And at some reasonable stage, um, the person that was bidding against me stopped. But the auction was due to end at uh, midnight American time on a particular day. So I knew that was seven o'clock in the morning, our time. So I set my alarm for quarter to seven so I could go on the website and make sure I'd still got the top offer. <laughs> and uh, I kept the top offer. And so to cut a long story short, I fixed up to go and have lunch with Lauren and her partner. Where they live now, the thumb that looks uh, the what looks like a thumb on the left. That's where San Francisco, where I was staying. Um, Lauren Artress lives where the red marker is across the bay and over to the right there. So the next scary thing was I had to get the right sort of train to get myself over there. And there's a system in San Francisco uh, called the BART system. And there's this helpful map and I managed to work it out. I managed to get the right ticket at the right machine. And I ended up successfully getting to their house. Now, uh, Lauren has a female partner <coughs> and they live in a retirement village, which has about 10,000 occupants. I, I've never seen anything like it. it so they were all um, not exactly old, but they were all retired. And the whole village was geared up to people's leisure needs with a swimming pool and a golf course and everything you could possibly want. <clears throat> so they gave me lunch and Lauren gave me a tour on a sort of golf buggy thing. Oh, that's her and her partner on the left. Um, at the top is uh, their dining room where we had lunch. And that's the view out of their room at the bottom there. I mean, it was just amazing. It was surrounded by hills. Oh, you can see them just behind uh, the two women there. You can see the hills behind. And it was such a lovely day. And then she said to me, would you like to go and walk our community labyrinth? Well, would I like to go and walk their community labyrinth? Yes, of course I would. Oh, that's the view from their house. That's a very unflattering picture of me, so we'll move on. So here's the uh, labyrinth in this place called Rossmore. Now it wasn't built by Lauren, it was a community one, but she and I both walked it together. That's Lauren um, coming out, I think a bit, and that's me in the middle of it. This was one of the best occasions of my whole life, friends. <laughs> It, it's really, um, I mean, I, I went to San Francisco because of this, but I never dreamt I'd actually meet Lauren Artress, let alone walk a labyrinth with her. So I must move on and not talk about this all the time. Oh, let's go to Kansas. Um, I'm just going to come back a moment and look at you all, and make sure you're all there. Oh yes, you are. And hello, Heather and Doreen who joined late. And hello, Rosemary, I don't think I saw you earlier either. And I've got a cough, so I'll just mute. I've had a bit of a throat infection this last week. So my voice, my voice isn't being very good, but uh, I'll keep on talking. So I'm gonna tell you about Kansas now. And I had to get the flight, an internal flight from California to Kansas. And in terms of the aeroplane flights, that was the most amazing, flying across America in a horizontal line and going over ranges and ranges of mountains. I think probably they were ones in Colorado. I'm not sure now, I knew at the time. And it just makes you think that the world is so big. 
and there's so much space and there were so many mountains. But let me go back to my slides. So California is on the left, Kansas is in the middle of the states. And as I said earlier, um, my friends Matt and Barbara live on the right on the border with Missouri. And here's a view showing um, Kansas City on the right there. The red arrow is now pointing to some words that say Overland Park. And that is where uh, Matt and Barbara live. In fact, they, in fact, they don't live there and the arrow's in the wrong place. They, that is where it says Overland Park, but um, that red marker sign you can see is further down. That's where they actually live. So they live on the edge of Overland Park. And now I want to tell you another story, which is, a get, is another sort of miraculous story because in the 90, late 1980s or early 90s, I think it was the late 80s, my parents who were in Bristol at the time, my dad was a Methodist minister and he was in his last appointment as a minister. And he was given the opportunity to do an exchange, an American exchange. And so he exchanged with an American pastor and his wife. And they had, um, I can't remember how many weeks it was now, but quite a long length of time in Kansas. Now, I always knew that my parents had gone to Kansas, but I didn't know where. And Kansas is a big place. The, um, the state is as big or bigger than our, our own country. So. Um, no, it's bigger, isn't it? It's much bigger, yes. I knew I was gonna say something silly. Um, so Kansas is a really big place. I knew my parents had gone to Kansas. And at some stage I uncovered, um, I, I found a picture that my parents had been given when they had this American stay. And it shows the picture of a lake. And on the back it says, uh, a lathy lake. And when I knew I was going to go stay with Matt and Barbara, I told them about this picture and I said, it says a lathy on it. And they said, well, that's the next city to us. We're right next door to a lathy. And um, I think my next slide, yes. So there's Matt and Barbara, that's where they lived. No, no, they don't, hang on. That's where Matt and, Matt and Barbara live, where the red marker is. And just down to the left, it says Alethe, because Alethe and Overland Park are right next to each other and Matt and Barbara live right near the border. And I just couldn't believe it. I mean, in the whole of America, <laughs> the only people I knew lived that distance away from the place where my parents had gone in the late 1980s, it was, it, it, it was just amazing. I think I'm showing there the whole of America and one arrow representing, the downward arrow representing where I was going to stay and the other arrow representing where my parents went. I mean, we couldn't really have been closer if we had tried. Well, Matt and Barbara live uh, in a street or in an area called Noland. The numbers are so big. By the way, the roads are so big and they're so long and they go on and on forever and ever. And the numbers are so big of the houses and the streets. This is where Matt and Barbara live. And that's their actual house. Look, it's number 12612, 12,612, their houses. And this is them, in fact in their kitchen. And uh, this is their house. 
On the left there is a picture of a sunflower because Kansas is the sunflower state and they've got that as a welcome just outside their front door. And I had five days there. So I'm just gonna go through them chronologically. Wednesday, we went to visit the church in Alethe where my father had been the minister for that time. Now it's no longer a church, it's, it's, it's used for church purposes, but the actual church congregation had joined up with someone else and what I'm very sad about is that Barbara managed to track down somebody who remembered my parents going. Only that lady died three months before I went out there. So uh, I didn't actually meet anyone that remembered them. But this was the church that they went to. And this is the inside. We were allowed to go inside. And so I stood in the pulpit there on the left. And imagine my father um, standing there 30 years previously. We also visited Matt and Barbara's then church. Now this church, and I'd heard a lot about it because when Matt and Barbara came over to Wyndham each year, they would tell us about Valley View United Church and the hundreds of people that went there. It, it did have a thousand, two thousand strong congregation, but that's how many all the churches, most of the churches have in these big cities. There's just so many people uh, and the churches are, are very big. And um, I was shown around Valley View United Methodist Church and on the Sunday I gave a talk, um, not in the main service, but in, in what they call their Sunday school class, but it's for adults. And I was able to talk about being a British pastor. We also went to another huge church called the Church of the Resurrection. Now this is a Methodist church, folks. <laughs> I know it looks like a space station, but this seats thousands of people. It's a mega church. And the pastor of this church is like a well-known uh, preacher and author. And this church has satellite churches. And when um, the pastor, whose name I can't remember, speaks, it gets projected all around all the satellite churches. It's amazing. We went in there. That's what the entrance looked like. Uh, they always call the main worship space the sanctuary. And this was like a huge theater. Look at all those seats. And they have more than one service. And that's their maximum occupancy, 2,298 people. Why they couldn't have made it 2,300, I'm not quite sure, but there we are. Well, I was shown, um, <clears throat> Matt, Matt was a college teacher and that was his college, so we visited there. Um, this is a bit out of focus, but it's, it's Barbara's stitching class that I was taken to. Uh, not class, I mean club. They were all, and that evening that I went, they were making um, a, a scissors holder for embroidery, you know, embroidery scissors. You can see the scissors there. It's got a little rabbit on the end. <laughs> and the case was in the shape of a carrot. Well, I'm afraid I declined to make it. I brought my kit home and, and Jen, you're supposed to have made it for me, aren't you? But never mind, it's still there waiting to be made. I, I quite like it not made, actually. No, we, did, we lost the instructions. We didn't have the instructions. Oh, well. Uh, Thursday. Now, here's Overland Park again. And on the left there is a marker that shows, wait for it, this is Kansas, the Wizard of Oz Museum. Now, I hadn't even known that there was a Wizard of Oz Museum, but I assumed that there would be. And so I asked if I could go, but I assumed it would be in Kansas City. 
but it turned out to be over 100 miles away and a two hour drive. But nevertheless, they said they would take me. My, I had my younger daughter really, when she was younger, she just loved reading. And she read all the Wizard of Oz books, all 13 of them, and she loves Wizard of Oz. And I so much wanted to go to the Wizard of Oz Museum for her, really. And on the day we were going to go, um, it was absolutely pouring with rain. I mean, absolutely coming down in sheets. And before we left the house, I could hear Barbara on the phone. And I think she was speaking to her daughter. And the daughter was obviously saying, oh, you mustn't go in this weather. And Bar I could hear Barbara saying, Jackie so much wants to go. And good for them because they're both in their 80s. Um, they took me through all this pouring rain um, via that place in the middle there, Topeka. That's the capital of Kansas, in fact. Um, we went there and looked round their sort of government building, which was extremely posh and plush. Just quickly show you these photos. So we went via Topeka to a tiny place called Wamiga, where there was the Wizard of Oz Museum. I really enjoyed it. There was Dorothy, she was there, and the Scarecrow, and the Tin Man, and the Lion. It was very interesting actually, because it had the whole history of the books, and the film, how the film was made. That is the actual, thing that was used to create the tornado in the film. That was what they used, that prop. Uh, there's the red shoes. That's Matt and Barbara going up in the balloon. Not really, it was on the ground. That was Thursday. Friday, we managed to find a labyrinth in Kansas City. So Matt and Barbara sat in their car while I, <clears throat> I went down and found this labyrinth and walked around it. It wasn't the most brilliant labyrinth in the world, but it's the only one I've walked in Kansas. It wasn't a very uh, sunny day, but we went into Kansas City. We went into a huge, shopping center called the Crown Center. And it has a hotel in it that's built into rock. So this waterfall is coming out of the rock, but it's in the middle of the shopping center. Winston Churchill was there in downtown Kansas with his wife, Clementine. I can't remember now why their statues are there, but um, there was some connection. They took me to Park University where they had met. And in the evening, we went to a concert. Now it was an Irish band called Scary Ball, and it was extremely loud. And I don't think Matt and Barbara realized what they put the tickets for. But having got us there and we were all sat, we, we, we all sat through it. But it was a funny thing to have gone to Saturday. The arrow at the bottom is now pointing to a little place called Ottawa. And that's where the Campbell's, one of the Campbell's daughters live. So on Saturday, we went out to Ottawa. We went via a famous chapel, which was Margaret Thatcher's chapel that when she went to when she was a child in Grantham, England, and somebody paid for it to be transported all the way out to Kansas. I suppose it was rebuilt brick by brick. Anyway, we stopped off there. 
we got to uh, Ottawa, we went to the visitor center where the daughter works. That's her on the left, Susan. So we, we had a good look around the visitor center. We looked around Ottawa. We visited the oldest cinema still going in the world, apparently. That's in this little place called Ottawa. And we went to Susan's home and they, they have an enormous amount of land. That's their house there in the middle. They have oil, oil wells on their land. You can see two of them in the picture on either side by the trees. That's their front room. That's an oil well. I can't remember how many oil wells they had on their land, but that's how they make their living. They find fossils. Um, the son, the Campbell's grandson, is always searching. Oh, they're not fossils, are they? They're um, axe heads, that's what I'm trying to say. Um, that's the grandson on the right there. And he had this lovely collection of axe heads that he'd found on the land. And we went searching for them. But needless to say, we didn't find one. That's a closer up view of the oil well. And that uh, the grandson was so keen to show me, he, I had to climb up and look at one of these big oil tanks. So this was my last day in Kansas and indeed in the States. It was Sunday. We went to Valley View United Church. I've already told you it's, it's huge. That was the pastors at the time, Bridget and Neil. Now, in fact, they've moved on and something has happened to Valley View Church, but I'll tell you about that in just a moment before I finish. This was inside waiting for the service to start. That's outside. All these big churches, they're like, um, they're like hotel foyers and corridors on the outside, uh, outside of the sanctuary space. Then um, there was this Sunday school uh, class, as I told you, which is quite a lot of adults and both Matt and Barbara spoke and introduced me as their British pastor. And this was what it said on the notice sheet in the middle there. Several Sunday school classes are meeting with English pastor Jackie Horton, the Campbell summer pastor, to include comparisons of English and American Methodism. All are welcome during the second hour. It was breakfast in the middle. There was the first hour of Sunday school, breakfast, and then the second hour. That's people having the breakfast. That's the breakfast. I just thought you might be impressed to see all those breakfasts. And then this is two pictures. There's a picture at the top and a picture at the bottom. Um, it's the left and right hand side of the people in the room who listened to me give my talk. I had uh, I, in the top picture, I'm actually sitting there. You might spot me there next to Barbara. It was a really good time and it was a really good visit to this church and they made me very welcome. They had lots of questions about English, British Methodism. They asked me um, about the whole uh, what Methodism, Methodism was doing about the same sex thing. They asked, I can't remember what else they asked. I just remember that one. But um, I managed to field all these questions. But this was the end of my trip, really. And I just want to end again with Matt and Barbara. By the way, it's Matt's birthday today. I sent him an e-birthday card. <laughs> I think he's 84. Um, what, ha what has happened to Valley View United Church is, although they had at one time a congregation of about 
2,000 people. It has gone down in recent years. So whilst we worry about a church of um, say 50 going down to perhaps 20 or a church of 20 going down to six or something like that, they worry about a church of 2000 going down to 600. And um, they had experienced a loss of numbers and that huge building that I showed you, they were struggling to keep it up. And so the congregation had to decide what to do. That church of the resurrection that I showed you that looked like um, a space station offered to take over Valley View United Church as one of their satellite churches. And that's what it was decided would happen. Neil and Bridget, the pastors have moved on. They've gone to another church. And Valley View has become part of the empire of the Church of the Resurrection. Well, Matt and Barbara tried it for a time, but they really didn't like it because the sermon each Sunday is from the Church of the Resurrection. It's projected in on a screen. They found it much more impersonal and not at all what they were used to. So they now go to another uh, large Methodist church. Now, since I was in the States, um, of course, we had COVID, but they did manage to come over in the summer. And in fact, they came to Swaffham Methodist Church and those um, on the Zoom from Swaffham might remember them coming and they just spoke a little bit. And they'll be coming again this summer to, to Wyndham and I'll get them over here again. So if any other church would like to put in a bid for, for meeting them, um, but I can only take them to one place. <laughs> anyway, um, I think this is the end. Let me check it says the end. Yes, it does. So I will stop sharing my screen. It's two minutes to eight, which is very good timing. Now, would any in two minutes, would anyone like to ask me anything? Or are you all bamboozled into silence? Jackie, I don't want to ask you anything, but I would like to say how enjoyable I found that, how interesting, really interesting. And I'm not a labyrinth person, but I found that all really, really interesting. The whole, the, the size of America, everything. So thank you very much for sharing that. Thank you, Anne. Because of course, when you're giving a talk like that, you never know really how it's going to come across to other people. I feel as though it must be interesting. <laughs> it's good to hear that it was. Well, it, it is eight o'clock. May I just finish with one more story? I forgot to tell you. If you want to go, go. <laughs> but I just tell you what I did with my mat and my um, blanket that I took to San Francisco. And one thing I didn't have time to tell you, one thing I found disturbing about San Francisco was the number of beggars on every corner and that grid system, at the end of every block, there's somebody begging with um, a paper cup held out in front of them. Now, when I go into Norwich, I find it very difficult when somebody's begging and I usually, I usually end up giving somebody outside St Andrew's car park a pound. But when you're walking through a city and at every corner there's somebody begging, you can't give them all money. And, and anyway, you know it's not necessarily the right thing to do. But, um, but when I was leaving and going to go to Kansas, I didn't want to take those items I'd got for the sound bar on the aeroplane. So I sort of prayed about what to do with them. I walked out of the hotel lobby and directly outside the hotel was a man holding a paper cup and he was talking to a lady. So I went up to them and I said, excuse me, um, would you know anybody who would appreciate a mat and a blanket? And the lady who had been talking to the man with a begging cup said to me, I think you've got someone right here. And I gave this blanket and the mat to the man and 
he he could hardly believe it that someone was giving him these items. Now I know that's not very much, and I, you know, I'd have given I'd have given them to everybody on every block, but that particular person was standing outside the hotel, and and I was able to give it to him. The inflatable pillow I brought back with me because it was multicolored, and uh, and I wanted to keep it. So I still got that for any sound baths that there are in Norfolk. <laughs> in fact, perhaps we'll have one ourselves. You never know. <laughs> okay, folks. Thank you to everyone who's been to the sessions in January. There may be an odd one in the middle of February, but for now, this is the last of the Tuesday at sevens. So thanks for being here, everybody. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you. It's been it's been lovely. Okay. Thank you. Jackie. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 <laughs>